What's going on, everybody? It's Blandon here from Leverage Addicts Podcast. And today's episode, we're going to talk about the five simple steps that you can take to escape the mortgage death cycle and start building wealth, secure your family's financial future. Now, first of all, we got to define what is the mortgage death cycle, because this is not something that I made up. It's a pattern that I recognize after talking to thousands of families in this business. For the last seven, eight years, there are lots of good things we can learn. There's also things that I thought, hmm, this is kind of recurring and could be a problem. And here it is. When people buy a home, it's a very exciting event because you're buying a future that you and your family can go into and enjoy, right? Often you might be putting down 15, 20% deposit, but what you end up getting, it's not actually a house. It's actually a 30 year mortgage, right? When you buy a home, yes, you own it on the title, but the bank owns 80% of it. Most people are smart enough though. They look at ways to increase their repayments, look at strategies like revolving credit offset loans so they can pay it off faster. But at the end of the day, you're still using your income to chip away at that mortgage, right? And the worst part is that they get bored in that house, you know, like three years, four years later, like, oh, you know, don't like this neighborhood, or perhaps they want school zones and they end up upgrading the house. So they go on this hunt and they go find a much bigger place in a better neighborhood and they look at how much they can borrow. They find this brand new house. Now their mortgage is maxed out again and they start the cycle. And guess what? A lot of people just repeat this for like the next 10, 20 years until they have very little time for retirement. And then suddenly they're like, oh, I need to invest, right? But we all know that time is investment's best friend. And when you have little time, you can make mistakes and you could take too much risk for very little return. So the common challenge that absolutely everybody face is opportunity costs, how we spend our time, who we invest our relationship with and how we spend our money. Now, I'm not going to talk about like your relationship goals or your professional goals, purely just your financial, because this is something that I look at every single day. And there's always going to be a trade-off with financial decisions. You often need to sacrifice something today to gain more in the future. It might be common for a lot of things, but definitely for finances. So here are the five steps you can take to move away from the mortgage death cycle and start building a solid financial future. To get out of the death cycle, the first step is to understand what your financial future will look like if you just carry on doing what you're doing. The universal truth is that numbers don't lie. So if you just carry on doing what you're doing, you can project out where you end up wealth wise. If you sit down to put everything on a spreadsheet, you can roughly work out how much you can pay off on your mortgage and what your wealth will look like in 10, 20 years time. So the first step I would recommend is seek guidance from a financial advisor so you can have a clear understanding of the trajectory of the future. Yes, you're going to get pay rise, potentially you could win lotto, but in terms of how much impact it has on your wealth building. So things can happen. We can always take away the low probability events and look at just the more certain ones. You'll find that earning more income will not contribute to your wealth building significantly. So the second step is to decide whether or not that future is something you want and decide to make changes today. Why do I say decide twice there? Because it's all about the decision. The changes is usually just a decision. You just need to say, hey, I'm going to make a difference and I'm going to take action today. I consider myself very fortunate because some might not know, I never ended up finishing high school and I started working full time. I went to art school for a couple of years and I didn't finish. Then I got a job at Foot Locker full time and I worked there for a few years. Now, if you understand the Asian culture, my parents pretty much disowned me because of that, right? First, you didn't finish high school, then you went to art school, and now you go end up selling shoes. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with selling shoes because I love my Jordans as well. But there was a random day at work that really changed everything for me. I consider myself very fortunate because I was standing in the shop one day and for some reason I could see myself in 10 years time. And basically, I was doing the same thing my relationship with my family wasn't good. I was still going out partying and drinking and I was scared. I was frightened of this future. And that day I decided I needed to change. So I went back to uni, did a certificate, ended up finishing a finance degree and I apply a lot of the learning from gaming into real life, you know, like goal setting, being obsessed with certain topics and just trialing things. Again, financial future is very easy to project roughly 
where you could end up if you just keep carrying it on. And then you just need to decide whether or not that is the future you want. The third step is build a simple roadmap and drop down the reasons why. It doesn't have to be super detailed because things change. I've made hundreds and hundreds of plans. They never work out to the way that I want, but it gives you some guidelines. It gives you rough idea on whether or not you're heading the right direction. That plan should try to include what kind of resources you have around you as well. Now, it's easy for me as an Asian to say that because in our culture, we're more likely to invest together with family and figure things out as a family. But even a Kiwi culture of independence, you can still find opportunities where it's win-win whether it's a joint venture with friends, cousins, or joint ventures with mum and dad. I feel like sometimes we have this obsession of having to do everything ourselves or like, hey, I made it on my own. But when you look at business, business is about creating win-win opportunities. How do you make money and add value for the other person and then benefit from that slightly yourself? And that's how I started because I had a coin drop moment two years out of uni. A broker showed me how I can use my mom and dad's property as a collateral to buy a bigger property. It was in the same period I understood that my parents didn't have much of an investment safety net. And I committed myself to learning as much about properties as possible, how I can utilize the position that we were in to help them win and to help myself win. And you project it out seven years, eight years later from a position where they had one house, still have their mortgage in their 50s, no other investments. If we aggregate everything, we have more than 10 million of properties and few developments that we are going to be doing that is going to set them up for their retirement. And the fourth step, simply putting the time towards it. To give you a personal story, in this business, at one time, I was really frustrated. I felt burnt out, underappreciated, underpaid. I think we had about 21 people at the time, but I was not making the progress I wanted to make as a business owner. I went to look for mentors and I would say it took me about 12 months to find the right one where I felt like they've done enough of what I want and they were a good communicator. My mentor, John, so when we first sat down, he made me look at my time. He said, look, the first thing you need to do is just record what you are doing currently every single half an hour. Now, I don't need someone to tell me to work hard, like 55 hours is just like a normal week for me. After two weeks, I went back to him with a schedule showing him my 55 hour week, what I do in each half an hour allocation. And then he asked me what my goals are. And really simply by connecting what my aspirations, the goals for the business and my time, there was a massive discrepancy. I wasn't spending the time that I need on those goals. That's why I feel frustrated and no progress. So from then on, I had to prioritize time to make sure I'm always working on what's important to me and work on the tasks that are related to my goals. This is the same thing with wealth building. Like a quick question for you. If you try to reflect back last two weeks, how much time have you actually allocated for wealth building? I think listening to this podcast is a good place to start watching some YouTube, reading some articles, but how much action have you taken in terms of implementing what you learn. And wealth building isn't one of those things that require your full-time attention, but it does require small allocation of your weekly, monthly schedule. It's one of those things where if you allocate the time, it will pay you dividends, like literally. Because if you make those wealth decisions, you'll be able to see it grow on paper over time. And the fifth thing you need to look at is surrounding yourself with like-minded individuals. One thing you can talk about with other people who have the same aspiration is the success stories. But more importantly, the challenge is what you want to discuss and address. Because the truth is that investing and building wealth is not as easy easy as people think. Otherwise, everyone would just get started like right away. There are things that you need to learn, the risks that you need to take, and there will be challenges that you face and you'll need other people that you can lean on. The property market that we are in right now is not the best. When property prices go up, everybody is stoked and happy. Right now is slightly depressed. So how do you turn that negative energy to something positive and opportunity seeking. If you're, if the people around your circle have lived long enough, they will give you insights that you've never thought about and they'll help you make better decisions. I'm only a normal person. So I started this year with more than $5 million of mortgages, just like everyone else. It triggers you, right? Seeing the interest rate go from two and a half percent to six and a half percent. Straight away, it's going to tighten a lot of the things that I'm doing. Now, I'm very fortunate. Some of it is still fixed on 2.99 for another couple more years. 
some are 3.99 and 4.99. Without those rates locked in, I definitely would be selling most of my properties. But having the people that I have around me gave me confidence. Even if I sell right now at a loss, I can replace those opportunities. I've just sold one of my South Auckland properties. It's a brand new four bedroom. Went on the market for just over a week and had a pre-auction offer. It's slightly below what I wanted, but I think just letting it go quickly was valuable because interest rate's so high. So now I'm gearing up to renovate another one to sell it. But what I'm gonna do is replace that equity with opportunity that has higher cash flow and look for opportunities where I can add more value. So I would end up in a stronger position by making those decisions. And so that's why it's so important to surround yourself with people with more experience, more wisdom, or have the same aspiration so that when you guys are faced with challenges, you can bounce ideas off each other. So if you do want to get away from the mortgage debt cycle, those are the five simple steps I would take. First of all, is to understand what the future looks like if you just carry on doing what you're doing. Second, decide if this is what you want, because if it's not, then take action, make changes. The third is build a roadmap. Give yourself strong reasons to why that's important. The fourth is to put the time in and just do it. And the fifth, surround yourself with like-minded individuals. And to get started, a simple way is just to talk to a financial advisor because they do this day in, day out. And if you want someone that is more specialized in properties than mortgage agents, could be one that you can consider. Now, if you got up to this part of the episode, I have one small favor to ask. If you have found value, please share this episode with one person who you think will get something out of it. And until next time, signing out, I'll see you guys in the next episode.